Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Salty Softeners, Salty Rivers, efficient ways to save salt water and our rivers. We really appreciate all of you coming, uh, joining, joining us tonight. What really has surprised us is the number of people that registered so quickly for this. So obviously salt and our rivers are two things that are pretty important to you and, and water, of course, needless to say. Um, and on that note, before we go any further with this evening, I'm going to introduce you to, there we go. I'm going to introduce you to my colleague, Rasha Abusita, who's going to do the Aboriginal Land Acknowledgement. Uh, Rasha, over to you. You just have to unmute yourself. Okay. Thanks, Evan. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to our event. I just want to acknowledge as we gather here, we are reminded that Guelph is situated on treaty land that is steeped in rich indigenous history and home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people today. As a community, we have a responsibility for the stewardship of the land on which we live and work and a responsibility to foster reconciliation and respect for indigenous people who have been stewards and caretakers for this land for generations. Today, we acknowledge the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation of the Anishinaabe peoples on whose traditional territory we are meeting today. And we, are in, and we encourage folks to continue educating themselves on all current issues facing First Nation communities and people across Ontario and Canada. And also to learn how to take action to uplift and support Indigenous people from coast to coast to coast. Thank you all. And now we are going to move to our announcement for next week event. We're gonna have the climate COVID and kids health in marginalized communities. It's going to take place on um, uh, November the 26th. So we encourage you, if you are interested, please join us and uh, you, you can find more details on the website. The next uh, event will be after on December 8th, it's gonna be a food fight. Uh, I'm not allowed to give you more information. We'll keep it as a teaser for uh, later uh, updates. So hang on and uh, stay tuned with us. Thank you. Um, and now I will be handing the presentation to Jaden Lasichok, uh, who is our summer student working with us as the outreach and marketing specialist. Jaden is passionate about climate and social justice issues. She has a BA in environmental governance from the University of Guelph, and she's currently studying her master's degree in geography. Jaden, as this may be your last few days at Emerge, I would just want to say that we are thrilled to have you working with us. And so far we have enjoyed every single co-working time we spent together. I would like to thank you here for all the great work and we wish you the best in your next endeavor. Tonight, Jaden will give us a brief intro and she will uh, share with us our upcoming events. Over to you, Jaden. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Rasha, um, for that. I have enjoyed working with Emerge so much. I've learned such an incredible amount of things uh, with Evan and Rasha, and it's just been a blessing, and I'm so grateful for this opportunity, as well as the opportunity um, to sit with you. Steve works as the Water Conservation Program Coordinator with more than seven years working in the sustainability field. In 2018, he joined the Water Conservation and Efficiency Team with the City of Guelph. In his current role at the City, Steve coordinates the multi-residential water audit and water submitter rebate programs. In addition to, this, to these programs, he focuses on community education. This finds Steve leading tours of the local water services facility and in front of classrooms at schools across the city, discussing source protection, conservation, efficiency, and best practices related to water. Steve will speak to us about the wealth perspective on softening your water. Steve, thanks for joining us tonight. Over to you. I guess first I should say, can everyone see my screen? Excellent. So uh, uh, first I'd like to say thank you to, to Evan and Rasha and, and Jaden for inviting me here tonight. 
Um, I'm really excited to, to talk to everyone about uh, water softeners and, and the salt we use in them and, and how it can affect our, uh, our waterways. Um, and so I think I'd like to also start by saying um, I, I'm really excited to be here with, with our other speaker, Steve Gumbos from the region of Waterloo. Um, the city of Guelph and the region of Waterloo have uh, partnered, had, had long had partnerships and, and as it relates to uh, water softening salt and and the uh, the health of our rivers we've actually been looking at this since 2009 and so uh, since then what we have found is that the speed and grand rivers are approaching chronic exposure limit to chlorides to, so um, to the salts that we're putting in and there's multiple reasons why winter road salting is the the obvious factor especially this time of year uh, we're all looking out for the, that first big snowfall and the uh, the salters to hit the road uh, of course water softening the the topic of the night and a, a growing uh, concern is is saltwater pools as they become uh, more popular uh, and and uh, more people are putting in pools these days so the elephant in the room when we talk about uh, salt in our rivers is winter road salts. And I don't want to spend too much time here just based on the, uh, the focus of the event. Um, but you'll see some of the numbers of our road salting, at least for the last three years. And it is considerable. Um, so in 2017, 2018, uh, we applied almost 11, 11 million tons, or sorry, kilograms of uh, salt application to the rows. So that's, th those are the salter trucks that you see. And then uh, the number you see beside that, the 95,000 liters is what we call direct liquid application, which is essentially a brine. Um, the good news here, and I think it is a good news story, is we are seeing that salt application go down year over year for the last, uh, over the last three years. And you'll see that the brine content goes up but even that has been reducing. So that's wonderful news. And I think it's, it's important to note that the city is in a place where it has to find that balance between public safety, liability and environmental protection. And some of the things that we're doing, uh, certainly to get that salt number down is, uh, we're not salting roads uh, across the board uh, all the same. So roads are classified in different ways. Arterial roads are gonna get the most salt and now uh, secondary roads are gonna get a little less and so on. Um, so that's one way we're able to save salt. Uh, we're doing better equipment maintenance on our trucks so that they're, they're working as they should be working. And of course, uh, data is, is the, the days we're living in. And so GIS tracking, knowing how much salt we're putting on different roads has allowed us to r reduce and track where we're putting it, uh, where it's going, where it's landing. Um, so altogether, I think it's, it's a, a good news story, but it should also note that there's nuance to it. Um, when we have warmer winters and we, and we see less snowfalls, of course, we're gonna use less salt. And so that does play a factor in, in increased salt uses in some years, reduced salt, salt in other years. And so kicking back to softening, um, Guelph, as most of you probably know, is, is reliant on groundwater. And we are the largest community in Canada that relies almost entirely on groundwater. And as it relates to softening, about 70, 70 to 80% of households in our city have softeners and are using softeners. And to put that into context, it's about 38,000 homes. And uh, softening accounts for approximately 25% of that, that chloride loading in our rivers, salt in our rivers. And my guess is that number is actually probably higher these days because uh, the numbers that I, I'm using are from 2016. Um, and as you see, the last three years, we've seen a reduction in, in road salt use and winter, winter salt use. And so as those numbers go down and as our city continues to grow, as more people move here and, and we build condos and more residences, uh, softener use is going up. And so that percentage is only going up or, or likely going up. And so why are we softening water? Well, um, using hard water results in, in scale buildup. And so people are worried about their appliances, our dishwashers or washing machines, um, scale buildups on taps and things like that. And so uh, softening water reduces a lot of that scale buildup and, and, and the perceived problems, some real, some perceived that, that are associated with uh, using hard water. Of course, it's easier to clean and to create a lather with soap and things like that. And, and then there's the soft water feel um, that people tend, to, people tend to like. So how we soften water. Um, 
most people will have something something like the picture you see on the right hand side of the screen a softener in their basement uh, i often refer to it as the, the black box in the basement because we don't typically think uh, a lot of our softener we go down we load salt when we need to uh, and then we disappear for another month or however long it takes before we need to reload it with salt and so the taller tank you see on the left hand side is is the resin tank and it's full of resin beads water passes through that hard water passes through that and the calcium and magnesium are are are, are drawn to that resin and they replace salt that is already there and so so when that resin tank fills up, uh, it has to be flushed out, it has to be recharged, and a salt brine is what has to go through that tank to recharge, and the minerals are sent down the drain. And the way we are setting our, our water softeners are based on uh, grains per gallon of hardness. And the average in Guelph is 21 grains per gallon. And uh, Steve Gombos, who's the next speaker, will, will speak a little bit more intimately to, to what this all means and how, it, how water softeners function and, and how they should be set. So collectively, there is a lot of salt being used with softeners. Uh, it's estimated that, again, in 2016, over 5 million kilograms of salt are used used specifically based on, on softener use and nothing else, residential softener use. Um, and that's expected to grow to 7.2 million kilograms as our population increases and it is increasing. And uh, for the individual household and many of you tonight, if you have a softener in your basement, that's usually about 175 to 200 kilograms a year. Uh, we talk, we're talking a lot about salt and, and salt in our rivers, but softeners are also associated with a, a pretty significant uh, water loss in that when we do that recharge, that water goes through your softener and, and essentially goes right to drain. And that accounts for 429, uh, 500 cubic meters of water. That's an awful lot of water going down the drain each year just for flushing our, our water softeners out. Uh, and if we were to eliminate that flushing altogether in their city, it would account for about 15% of, of water reduction targets that the city has made, which is, is particularly significant. So in 2017, 2018, the city of Guelph uh, and the region of Waterloo piloted the use of, of water conditioners. Uh, water conditioners we, we refer to, as, some people refer to as, as saltless water softeners. They are or not that, they, they, uh, they do not soften water. It is hard water that goes through, uh, but they did, we did trial the, uh, the use of, of water conditioners. And that trial was a real world application. So it was used in homes with families of, of different sizes um, and, and makeups a, a, to see how the technology worked for them. And you'll notice the picture on the right hand side, that is a water conditioner, not a water softener. And you can see that they look very much alike. So you could be in a home with one of these see it, and, and really not know the difference. And so the report was released on this trial uh, and it was released in the fall of 2019. And it is available for everyone on Water Softener Facts. Water Softener Facts is a, is a website hosted, uh, again, in partnership with the city of Guelph and the region of Waterloo um, as, as a third party um, information site. So um, I, I do invite you to, to go check out that, that site. It is very useful. There's a lot of facts on there for people to demystify themselves, whether it's uh, linked to water softeners, uh, water conditioners, how they work. Um, so, so please visit that when you have some time. And that report uh, that was released uh, looked at the changes in water use, the changes in salt use in the house, uh, as well as the user's attitudes. And so, they're very different technologies, a water conditioner to a water softener. And like I said, the water that comes through the system in a water conditioner is not soft water, it is hard water. And, and you saw that resin tank in the last slide. So similarly, water will push through that resin tank and the magnesium and calcium ions uh, stick to these, the, the resin, these beads. And they reach a certain size and then they break off and go back into your water. So that's why your water is still hard because the, the magnesium and the calcium is still there. However, um, they remain in the water as insoluble particles. And so they won't, they won't form scale. And in fact, uh, it, it can, it descales the plumbing in some, sometimes the fixtures in a household. So there's no salt required. Uh, there's no energy required. And of course, there's no water required uh, for, for backwashing because there is no backwashing. 
So the way we uh, went about this study uh, collectively is uh, back in July of 2017, uh, a phone survey was, was uh, sent out. And through that so phone, phone survey, um, we were able to identify a, a list of participants and 30 were shortlisted for interviews. Uh, ultimately 28 were asked for uh, a focus to be, to come out to a focus group. And, uh, and from that focus group, the, uh, the participant list was refined again. And then from that group, uh, there were home visits. Uh, in going into these households, we wanted to make sure a that people had a functioning water softener uh, so that we would we get real results from the household. Uh, we wanted to make sure that their appliances were in good standing order. We didn't want to uh, Im implement a new technology uh, and find out that uh, appliances were were either breaking or, or seemed to be breaking because of this technology. So everything was made to to we were made to know that everything was in good working order. Um, after the home visits, 18 households were, were identified, 18 participants, we should say, uh, were ID'd. And then the technology was installed. The conditioners were installed in those homes. And then from January 2018 to December 2018, um, these households were tracked. So they met as focus groups um, and uh, a sub meter was put on. To these to these households, so we were actually able to track uh, minute to minute water use and, and recognize uh, how much water was being saved, how much water was being used. Um, so it, it was quite a robust robust data set that came from that. And then, of course, January 2019, uh, the, the study was completed and, and the report was put together over the course of of that year. So, in that pilot. Uh, like I said, conditioners were trialed in 18 homes. Um, the homes were different, different household populations, uh, families, families of five, there were kids in some households, other households, households were maybe a household of two with retirees. Uh, so they had different lifestyles on top of people, different ages of home. We have a, a really uh, diverse uh, uh, set of homes in Guelph because we are quite, quite an old city. So homes that were 100 years old to homes that were built in the 90s or early 2000s. And the findings were that 13 of those homes, 13 of the 18 participants um, decided that they wanted to keep this technology. And it, it's, uh, it's not as easy as that. There's a lot of nuance to that. And I'll talk about it in the next slide. Three of those people became ambassadors for the technology. 10 people kept the technology, but did acknowledge that there were some drawbacks. And then five of the 18, uh, just had the, the equipment removed when all was said and done and they went back to their traditional softeners. Part of this was asking people how likely they would be to recommend it to a friend. And I mentioned before that there were a few ambassadors of the product, but when it came down to it, there were more people, 47% basically said they, they would not recommend the technology to friends, family, or anybody else. And so how we measure things like this is a net promoter score. And a net, net promoter score is a standard industry metric uh, for measuring customer experience. And when all was said and done, so if you leave out that yellow piece of the pie and you subtract the, uh, the red from, from the green, and we ended up with, uh, or sorry, the green from the, you subtract the red from the green, and you end up with a score of negative 18. Um, so I wanna say, uh, first and foremost, but the technology does does work as it's intended to. It's not intended to soften water. It's intended to uh, help descale um, your system. It's intended to get away with not having to use a softener and salt. And it, and it does work as intended, but the nuance to it all was that not everyone liked the technology as it was. And so there were several advantages identified by the participants. Uh, obviously cost savings. People aren't having to go uh, buy bags of salt, uh, their utility bills can drop a little bit because they're not wasting that water. And there is energy involved in running a softener in your home. Um, no lugging those heavy bags, those 18 kilogram bags of salt around uh, or having to remember to buy them at the store. I talked earlier about softeners being kind of the black box in the basement that we, we tend to forget about. And I think there were a lot of people in the study 
and that actually didn't quite consider where that salt was going to. You put the salt in and as long as you have soft water, you forget about it. And, and, and that's really typical of, of water use in general, that once it's down the drain, we, we don't think a lot about it. And so when these people started to think about it, when they're using their conditioner, it did give them a sense of pride that they were doing something um, for their environment and for their environment very locally. Um, other advantages, the ability to drink from any tap. Um, Steve Gombos uh, will, will speak a little bit about the health impacts uh, with the softener. And then descaling of the plumbing. It, when you run these systems, uh, you know it's working from the get-go because you tend to see a, a yellowish hue to the water when it comes out. You do have to flush the system a bit. Um, so it's very obvious that it's descaling the system. And, and uh, there were a lot of disadvantages as well. And so the biggest disadvantage for most people was, was dishwashers. By far the most was dishwashers. Um, it was perceived to not be cleaning well. I talked about those, those uh, the calcium and magnesium flow through. And while it doesn't stick to the plumbing and it doesn't create scale, it does create a, a little bit of a white fine powder and you can wipe that away. But when people came out with dishes with a few more spots than they're used to or, or having to wipe off that, that fine powder, um, it wasn't something they enjoyed. Um, and, and dishwashing was a, a, a big hurdle for several people. The hard water feel, uh, again, uh, it isn't soft water coming through, it's, it's back to hard water. So you know you do notice it in a shower when you're washing your hair or you're, you're creating kind of suds from the soap. Um, there is a difference for people. There's no indication the system is working. I would say from the get-go, there's a bit of, there's an indication, like I said, that the water when you flush it out tends to come out yellow. But beyond that, uh, it's really hard to tell whether the system uh, is working, whether the resin has, has expired because you will have to replace the resin at, at a certain point. Um, and so that question mark hanging above that system is something that was definitely uh, uh, considered a disadvantage for people. Um, there's no indication the media needs to be replaced. It will be need, need to be replaced after four years, maybe four or five years. Um, but the system doesn't show you. It's not like a, 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 a brine tank where you see that salt go down and you know that you need to fill it with another bag of salt. And of course, Conditioners are not a mainstream, tech, mainstream technology at this point. And so there were questions around, you know, if I sell my home and I have a conditioner, how is it going to per be perceived? Is it going to be a drawback to homeowners? Is, is it going to be an advantage? And, and just that unknown is, is kind of a disadvantage for people. And now there's a lot of nuances in the advantages and disadvantages because um, there were a few people that didn't see the dishwasher as, as a, disadvantage at all, a disadvantage at all. And they noted, noted that there were, there were solutions to some of that. Not everyone felt that feeling you know, hard water in the shower was a disadvantage, but, but definitely a certain amount of people did. Um, likewise, the descaling of the plumbing uh, would, would normally be a great advantage to most people, but there was one household that uh, scale was in, in some sense of the way, uh, keeping their tap together. And so when it, that was descaled, it created a, a leak from their tap, which is, is funny, but also a, a very good indication that the technology was working. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that reducing, there's, there's multiple ways to go about reducing salt um, use in your house. And first and foremost, a new technology. Um, I, I would say none of these that I have listed are um, in an order of how people should, should look at it. But if you have an old timer style softener, they could go off every evening, maybe every third day. Um, but people might be and often are uh, softening their water too much, more often than they need to, depending on the size of the household, whether it's two people or five people. And so uh, upgrading technology to an on-demand uh, or a demand-based model that is going to uh, adjust based on how much water you're using in the house will limit unnecessary salt and water waste. Um, and modifying plumbing, most houses are softening all the water that comes into the house, cold and hot, and that's unnecessary. Um, and shifting the softener just to the hot can see a lot of benefits, uh, water savings, uh, big salt savings, and uh, switching appliances. Um, if you're looking for in, in the, uh, the market for a new appliance, uh, dishwasher or washing machine, there, there are dishwashers and washing machines that exist with softeners built in. So you could omit a softener in the house, move to an appliance that has one. And again, that's gonna re reduce uh, your salt use uh, considerably and, and certainly your water use as well. And then I would say uh, consider water 
conditioning technologies. They're out there, they work, but I, I strongly recommend doing research on it um, and, and getting a sense for, for what you should expect if you do uh, decide to go the route of a water conditioner. Um, uh, and with that, I would say a good place to start with that research, again, is water softener facts. Um, like I said, the study that was done uh, over the course of, of 2018 is all on there. Uh, it discusses uh, water softeners, water conditioners, and it is full of very useful information. So, so I, I highly suggest and, and I invite everyone to go check out water softener facts. And with that, I'll kick it back to uh, Rasha. Thank you, Steve. What an interesting uh, results on the water conditioners uh, focus or research study. Very interesting. So now we will uh, move to the next speaker, who is uh, Steve Gombos. Steve works as the manager of water efficiency in the region of Waterloo, uh, where he helps conserve the region's vital drinking water while also helping people reduce water consumption. Steve has served on the board of directors for the Alliance for Water Efficiency and sits as a chair of the Ontario Water Works Association under the Water Efficiency Committee. Steve has authored numerous articles for trade publications related to water efficiency, waste management, and the environment. He frequently provided uh, topical presentations to international, national, and local audiences. Steve, thanks for joining us tonight. The floor is yours. Thanks, Rasha. Um, thank you, Merge, and uh, people of Guelph for having me. This is uh, uh, unusual for me to be presenting outside the region of Waterloo, so I'll uh, try to keep my um, hat on for um, considering everybody. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about the impacts of softeners, uh, pick up where Steve left off. Uh, talk a little bit about softener efficiency. Excuse me, excuse me Steve, can I ask you to go into slide, uh, slide view mode? Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. All right, so um, yeah, softener efficiency, and then I'll touch on some alternative technologies um, that you might want to do a little bit more research on. So we talked about the fact that uh, Guelph and Water Region has very hard water. Uh, in regional Waterloo uh, urban system, the median is around 26 grains per gallon, which is 453 milligrams per liter. The United States Geological Survey says that anything over 3.5 grains per gallon is moderately hard. Um, just to look at uh, what these measures are, um, everything to do with water softeners is done in U.S. measures. They're all uh, manufactured there, or even if a softener is manufactured in uh, Europe, it'll often be delivered here uh, with uh, everything in its uh, owner's manual written in U.S. gallons and grains per gallon. So one U.S. grain, uh, one grain per U.S. gallon equals 17.1 milligrams per liter. Uh, milligrams per liter is sometimes also expressed as parts per million. Um, mainly what you find and what, you're, what you hear about with hardness is calcium and magnesium. So those are the, uh, uh, the minerals in the water that are suspended that can form scale on your uh, plumbing. So as Steve mentioned, we did uh, have a test rig set up at our William Street pumping station in uh, the city of Waterloo. And from 2009 to 12, we did some testing of various water softeners so we could find out um, how much salt and water they use and uh, how they work. Uh, we didn't know a lot about it, but we, we kept getting questions from the public about water softeners and how they could potentially save water. So um, anything over 10 grains per gallon is considered very hard water. So at uh, 34 grains, we were running uh, those softeners through the worst, uh, well, hardest water in the region. So uh, Steve mentioned about the ion exchange process that the, uh, the hardness ions stick to the resin beads in your brine tank, which is the tank on the right there. Uh, I'm sorry, in the resin, the resin tank. So the water flows through the resin tank and uh, the calcium magnesium sticks to those uh, resin beads 
and the resin beads have uh, salt on them and the salt is released. So you're trading the salt for the calcium and magnesium in the resin tank. Um, eventually those beads become exhausted uh, once they've released all the salt. And so then they have to be regenerated uh, with a salty brine solution. So then the uh, flow reverses and um, the mineral, the, uh, the uh, resin tank is recharged. And uh, then there's a backwashing that happens as well to clean out the tank. And, um, and then um, there's a, 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 depending on the type of softener, uh, a, a brine solution is then made in preparation for the next recharge. In some softeners, uh, the brine mix doesn't happen until um, the time of recharge uh, because uh, there's a little computer in the controller that uh, um, estimates how much uh, a brine solution needs to be made. So that makes it a little bit more efficient. One of the things that nobody talks about much is that uh, water softening can actually potentially make the, uh, the, the softened water a little bit corrosive. And uh, in, especially in large facilities where they use lots of water and there's lots of flow, um, you can get pinhole leaks in the plumbing as the, uh, as the copper piping gets uh, basically worn away by the, uh, by the uh, soft water. Uh, we found that in one of our, our nursing home facilities, we were getting pinhole leaks all over because they're running uh, the uh, uh, soft water. For more details on that, uh, there's a link there uh, to uh, Health Canada that has a, a really good um, uh, technical uh, guideline and information sheet on uh, water softening, and uh, it, it, it touches a lot of the bases very well. Uh, so again, uh, I don't want to flog it to death, but uh, on the environmental side, uh, salty backwash water goes down the drain, um, doesn't get treated at your wastewater treatment plant. Also, you're, you've, you've added salt to your drinking water. That also, uh, most of it ends up in the, uh, uh, in the sewer and at the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, so just in the region of Waterloo, you know, we're generating billions of liters of backwash. Uh, it represents about 7% of household water use um, uh, just for backwash and your softener. So you can save that water. Um, um, and again, you're putting uh, salt into uh, perfectly good drinking water that meets all the drinking water guidelines. Um, there's greenhouse gas uh, emissions associated with pumping and treating the uh, water and delivering it to households for their use. And also uh, there's a big, uh, 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 a lot of uh, energy that goes into mining salt, um, processing it and delivering it to market. So, so we can save on greenhouse gases if we can cut down on that salt and water use. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, uh, softened water uh, coming out of uh, water softeners here in the region uh, are adding about 700 milligrams per liter of sodium to the water. People on low sodium diets should avoid drinking uh, uh, softened water for that reason. And uh, uh, public health uh, announcements have uh, confirmed that. On the other hand, drinking hard water is mineralized. Those minerals are good for you and it's considered healthier. Um, you know, we're putting about 16,000 tons of salt per year um, in the Kitchener Water Cambridge area into, uh, into our wastewater uh, system uh, from water softeners. Um, and again, I talked about that uh, chlorides are not removed. And uh, chloride is a part of salt, and that's kind of the, uh, the, uh, the material that uh, causes problems in our rivers and, uh, and can harm plants and uh, animals. Uh, so this, uh, in 2016, uh, Guelph and Waterloo Region jointly funded a, a consultant uh, analysis to, to, to look at what the environmental impacts from um, uh, salt were. And uh, you can see there that we had some monitoring results from the Galt wastewater treatment plant that discharges into the Grand River. And um, um, 15, 
uh, about half the wastewater uh, coming out of the wastewater treatment plant uh, uh, is chloride from um, water softening. A little further downstream, 15% to 25% of the chlorides in the waterways are associated with the residential water softening. So we talked about road salt and road salt is a very hard thing to reduce because if you don't put enough salt on the road, then you're liable when cars have accidents because of slippery roads. So it's a really, uh, road salt's a really tough one to tackle. But if we wanna try to reduce salt, uh, you know, we've got uh, all these water softeners and maybe we can uh, cut down on the softener salt. Uh, these are uh, the, uh, pictures of uh, uh, sort of common softeners that you see out on the market. So the one on the left uh, has the resin tank inside the brine tank, and then it's got a little controller on top. It's digital. It uses a little bit of electricity, not too much. Um, the unit on the right uh, is also fairly common uh, with the resin tank separate from the brine tank, but they are connected together and work together. Uh, the middle photograph is a, uh, uh, a, a softener that has two resin tanks. And uh, these types of softeners can be more efficient because um, when the uh, one resin tank is exhausted, it switches and starts uh, running water through the, the, the tank that still has uh, um, uh, fully charged resin and then it recharges the first tank that was exhausted. And you can see there that the, there's a, a, a brine tank to the side. This is a nice small unit and um, um, it's all mechanical. So there's actually, it doesn't run on electricity. And these types of units utilize 100% of the capacity of the resin. So they're, they're gonna be more efficient. The, the softers that you see uh, with a single resin tank, they're only going to use about 70% of the capacity within that unit before recharging uh, because they don't want uh, hardness breakthrough, they call it. So uh, if, you, if you use, a, say you had a party and you had lots of people over and you were using a lot of water, there, there's a spike in the water demand. And uh, uh, if you're close to the uh, full capacity of that tank, then you might start getting hard water through your taps. And, and uh, people don't like that. So they build in a reserve, reserve capacity. But what happens is you're losing, when, when you're recharging that softener, you're, you could potentially be uh, wasting quite a bit of capacity in the tank by um, doing the backwash and recharge. So a twin tank unit is typically going to be more efficient. Here are some common controllers uh, uh, that you'll see on water softeners. The one on the left is the least efficient and it's a timer. So what you do is you're, it's more or less guesswork. You, 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 you estimate how much water you're running through uh, your household, how many people live in the household and so on. And you essentially set this timer to recharge uh, uh, the, uh, the resin tank, uh, say once a week or twice a week or three times a week. Um, and uh, whether you need it or not, it's gonna recharge. So that's the least efficient. Uh, then there's a mechanical one um, that has basically a, a, a built-in water meter. And this is a little more efficient. And, uh, but again, you kind of have to estimate how much uh, water you can put through the the uh, the softener before it's time to regenerate uh, and you set that on the dial and then it'll just regenerate after a certain number of in this case gallons runs through the through the unit then we have a more efficient unit called uh, that they call demand initiated regeneration so it's a little bit more of a computer it uh, it uh, actually tracks water consumption within the house and uh, will um, try to maximize that buffer that I talked about um, uh, to try to use as much of the capacity of the resin tank as possible before regenerating. And um, uh, it, it, it uh, gathers data 
from the water consumption over time and uh, they say it becomes more efficient after about uh, you know, a month of collecting data from the household or th one to three months. I've heard some different uh, things on that. Um, so those are some of the things uh, that's good to know. Um, some of the typical problems with softeners that we're finding, uh, uh, leaks, of course, uh, draining constantly, uh, regenerating too often, um, and it, there's different settings on the unit. So even if you, the, the tough part about water softeners is that um, it comes uh, with different settings for how much salt they use and, and, and salt and water and uh, they're adjustable even if they're considered an efficient uh, softener. If they're not set up correctly, uh, then they become inefficient. Um, so, you know, if whoever installs it doesn't set the, water, the, the proper hardness of the water, if they, they say it's harder than it is, then it's going to regenerate more often because it's going to think it's running out of capacity. Um, the watersofternerfacts.ca website has mapping for uh, Guelph and Waterloo region that sets out what the hardness is in various neighborhoods. So the, the hardness of your water can change from one neighborhood to the next. So you can't just set one number. You have to, uh, it's good to know. And if you don't know the number um, and you don't see it on the map, call the water utility, they, they can uh, help you with uh, getting what the water hardness is for your area. Another thing, plumbing, and, we're f and, and I'll tell you more about this later, but um, there's a, a mixed bag. Like some people are softening the water that goes to the outdoor hose for, for their irrigating the grass and uh, gardens, not realizing probably that they're spraying salty soft water on their gardens. So that's a no, no. And then I've met, we talked about the drinking water. So, you know, it's not advisable to drink. So it really shouldn't be plumbed to your, the tap that you would use to, to, to get your drinking water. Um, I talked about the inefficient timers. Uh, if you don't put salt in the softener, in the brine uh, tank, then you'll get a hardness breakthrough. And then it takes a couple of regeneration cycles to get the soft water back in the house. Uh, it also fills your hot water heater up with the uh, hard water. So that's why it takes a couple of regenerations to, to get that uh, replenished. Um, if your softener gets old, um, then the resin becomes less efficient and uh, um, you know, you're gonna be complaining about hard water. So that's when you start setting, maybe telling it to regenerate more often because you think, you know, um, something's happened. It's probably because your resin is getting um, less efficient and doesn't work anymore. Um, so you got to look at that as well. Solutions. Read the owner's manual. See if you can adjust the settings yourself. Check your uh, hardness and all that and, uh, and look at how often it's reset. You can, even with a demand initiated regeneration machine, you can tell it to become a timer style softener. So you can bypass everything and tell it to regenerate three times a week if you want. Uh, that's not a good solution. Uh, but, um, you know, that's what you have to check for in case maybe you bought a house with a softener and it was already running. So you just left it. It's good to check that. Um, call a plumber uh, or a, a water softener dealer and um, um, hopefully you get uh, a knowledgeable uh, technician to come out and uh, make the changes to make it more efficient. Another option is to buy a more efficient water softener. Um, so uh, Madison Metropolitan Sewer District uh, has just launched a pilot program um, to, to have plumbers uh, go out and do these sort of uh, softener tune-ups and inspections. And they're offering, uh, they're doing that for free. And they also are offering um, uh, financial rebates for uh, customers um, who have softeners that aren't efficient because they'll go and do the tune-up and if they find it's a, like a timer-based unit, um, then they will qualify to, um, to replace their softener. Um, and what they're claiming is that the, you know, by doing a, a optimizing the softener, you can save 25 to 50% of your salt you can reduce it. So it's going to save money and help the environment. Um, 
on our Softener Facts website, there's a buyer's guide. I suggest you look at that as well. Um, the key thing you want to look for if you're buying a new softener is uh, make sure it's certified to the NSF ANSI 44 performance standard. Um, and what that standard says is that it should, it's a voluntary standard, so you won't see that stamp. There should be a stamp on the, um, on the softener somewhere saying it's certified to that, and it will be able to remove a minimum of 4,000 grains of hardness per pound of salt used in the softener. And at the same time, it should not, not use any more than four U.S. gallons of water per thousand grains of hardness removed. And um, you can learn more about that on the Softener Facts website. Um, here are some of the uh, uh, technologies that have been tested and may have potential to replace softeners in the household. Um, uh, and I would refer you to the Water Reuse Research Foundation. And uh, they've done uh, some testing there using a uh, uh, German uh, approach. And uh, there's been some other testing done since then by the US Water Quality Association on, on some of these technologies. Uh, so you can do some, uh, find out uh, what's out there. Uh, not a lot of these technologies uh, are available on the market. Uh, the, the promising one that came out of that study was the nucleation assisted crystallization and that led us to do some testing on our in our, in our uh, uh, softener testing um, facility and uh, looked promising and that's when we decided to go forward with the, uh, the field test of those 18 uh, units that uh, Steve uh, reviewed. So moving forward from a policy perspective in the region of Waterloo, this was kind of the hierarchy we came up with to suggest to people. Number one, if you can live without a water softener, as a matter of fact, right now, I don't have a softener. I've lived without one for a couple of years. It's not, it, it, it's, it's fine. Um, in fact, I grew up in Galt, Cambridge, and uh, um, we never had a softener for, you know, my whole uh, 20 years, you know, living at home. And uh, it was only when I bought my first house in Kitchener that it had a water softener. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I figured, oh, okay, I guess we're supposed to have a water softener, which is what a lot of people think. Um, and I realized that there are some aesthetic benefits as well as, you know, it protects your, your water heater. Uh, uh, it, it keeps the water heater um, more efficient if you don't have that calcium carbonate buildup on your elements. So again, I say uh, don't soften water at all or make softeners more efficient, as I've talked about. Um, try those salt and water-free alternatives or um, to help uh, combat that whole salt issue, uh, maybe you should soften hot water only. And in fact, that's what we're, uh, uh, we just started a pilot program in the Waterloo region where we're encouraging people to soften hot water only um, and we're offering rebates for uh, people that uh, convert their plumbing to softening hot water only. And it's a, it's a three-year pilot that we launched right in the middle of COVID this summer. And uh, so it's slowly building momentum. Uh, so uh, a study was done on how much hot water people use compared to cold water in a household. And uh, data logging results showed that 35% uh, of household water use is, is hot. So if you're softening only hot water, then you're going to reduce the amount of uh, salt and water that you need uh, for your softener by 65%. So in an average household of three in Waterloo Legion, um, you know, that's going to have significant uh, water bill savings. Um, uh, city of water, using City of Waterloo rates for 2019, um, the annual savings would be at least $39 because we're using, the, the measures I'm using here are the demand initiated regeneration softeners, which are more efficient. So um, I'm using very conservative numbers here. If you have an inefficient water softener, um, you'll save even more money. However, so $39 on your water bill per year, uh, three person home, $45 in salt savings. 
Um, so for combined uh, annual savings of $84. Uh, the other thing that isn't in this calculation is that um, you're going to immediately at least double the life expectancy of your water softener. So that means you're going to spend less on uh, the capital costs associated with buying a new softener because it's going to last longer. Um, so uh, a household of three will save 8,800 liters and 108 kilograms of salt and uh, approximately 48 to $50 in equivalent greenhouse gas uh, reductions on an annual basis. So that's year in and year out that you'll be saving. Um, so this is our pilot program. Um, and uh, there's a one-time rebate of $50. Our goal is to say uh, to get 1,200 households uh, to participate. That'll save 10,000 meters cubed of backwash water per year, 126 tons of salt, and 56 tons per year of uh, greenhouse gas. Um, payback, if it costs $200 to change the plumbing and we give you $50 rebate, uh, a family of three will have a payback in about two years. So that's, uh, that's kind of the standard in, uh, in the industry. You know, uh, it's pretty much a no brainer if the payback is uh, two years or less. Um, but, uh, you know, that's kind of a, um, a variable number because the cost to change the plumbing varies from household to household. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So one of the things we do is we want to ask res we're asking residents to check their plumbing. So we're sending out softener uh, hardness test strips. So it's a color coded test strip. It takes like two seconds to tell whether your water is soft or hard. Um, and there's color coding so you can get an idea of how hard the water is or how soft it is. And um, so we've asked people to send us back the test strips. Um, and uh, so far 295 households have sent us back uh, their hardness test results. And we asked them to go around and check the hot water and the cold water and other taps to see which ones are hard and which ones are soft. A lot of people don't know uh, what they're softening in the household. What we found is uh, that of the 295, seven households are softening hot water only. So not many are softening um, just the hot. However, um, if you go to an apartment building or even our office building here, uh, any, any commercial facilities, they're only softening the hot water. Why is that? Because there's no business case for softening cold water. Uh, calcium carbonate does not build up as fast in cold water as hot water. So when you heat water up, all uh, that, that calcification process happens faster. Um, so that's why we're, you know, if you want to protect anything with soft water, go for the hot, not, not necessarily the cold. Um, of the people that sent us back test strips, 20% of those households are softening the outdoor tap. And uh, in, many, in most cases, they don't realize that. Um, so this is irresponsible plumbing on the part of uh, plumbers and uh, um, water softener retailers. Or is it do-it-yourselfers that are, are, so are plumbing in their softeners and, uh, and not realizing that they should at least run hard water uh, to the outdoor tap and to the drinking water? 21% uh, of the households are also running soft water to the drinking water tap uh, from this tap, from these results. In some cases, uh, people are reporting that the soft, the water is soft coming out of the cold water tap in the bathroom, but not the hot. So that's uh, an unusual, unexpected finding. So we're learning a lot through this pilot program. Um, Again, uh, check out the Water Softener Facts website. Um, look at the, the study results posted there. You can learn more about how softeners work. Um, and uh, I've mentioned all the other stuff. So I think that's about it for me. Any questions? Um, before we get to the questions, Steve, uh, just be a couple of minutes here, folks. Okay, now I do.
Uh, just uh, just gave me a couple of moments. We actually have four different polls. We have we have a, a, a panel group that is going to probably answer a lot of the questions that came up through the chat. But before we get to the panel, we have four questions that we want to ask all of you. Before we get to, and there's a third panelist that you've yet to meet as well. But first, um, if you would look on your screens momentarily, um, there are four four questions total. We're going to give you about 30 seconds each to answer the polls. Uh, I promise it's not a test on the material that you've seen. We're looking to get an understanding of where your homes are at from a from a um, uh, from a uh, um, uh, um, uh, from a um, what are we talking about today? We're talking about softening water. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. There's the first question. So if you could all just respond to that as quickly as possible. And then, uh, especially the panelists, if you want to take a boo, just as we get to the end, when we end the polling, we'll see the final stats. Um, so the question is, uh, at this point, do you use a water softener in your home? And folks, uh, looks like we've stalled. So I think we're pretty close to completing it. And let's see, what are we? So we are, um, I'm going to share the results. So, so we are 73% of people do have softeners in their homes. And on that note, then I'm going to, if I can switch to the, um, I'm trying to figure out how to switch, switch to our next poll. Uh, and then there is an error. Here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, got it. Thank you. So do here's the second question. Uh, do you soften all of the water in your house? Yes or no? Oh my, this is interesting. It's going back and forth and back and forth. And I wonder if people really understand whether they know whether they're softening all the water in their house. Where it appears to be landing is about 69% say that they don't and about 30% say that they indeed do. And on that note, I'm going to switch to the third one and we'll launch the poll now. If you don't soften all the water in your house, do you soften the hot water only, only everything except drinking water or the dishwasher only? And it seems like we might have polling fatigue. Not as many people responding here. Okay, we're going to end that one. And it looks like the overwhelming uh, everything except drinking water in 68% of the 68% uh, of the questions. And then here's the last one: is how old is your softener? Try to guess as best as you can. Less than two years, two to five years, five to ten years, over ten years old. It seems to be getting a bit of a mixed bag there. And I see that some people are saying they don't have a water softener. That's why they're not answering the questions. And that's quite all right. This isn't meant to be statistically accurate. It's meant to give us a cross section of where people are at with things when it comes to water softening. So oops, uh, I'm going to share the results with you there. And it's between five and 10 years seems to be the, um, the, the largest segment that we um, um, that, that we have uh, when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to uh, um, the polling uh, and uh, also what we're talking about this evening and I'm just going to just quickly want to share the screen with you um, and introduce our um, our third, uh, our third panelist. So you've already met the first two panelists, um, but I, I want to take the opportunity to to introduce the third panelist and. Uh, Hugh Whiteley uh, is an adjunct professor at the University of Guelph, but that does little to describe the community mindedness, the, the, the selflessness with which he has thrown himself into the community on, I can't tell you the number of environmental issues. His heart and his passion is definitely um, in the area of, uh, of water, uh, but uh, all things planning related within the city and Hugh actually ran for public office uh, a few years ago as well. Uh, I remember that, that campaign very, very well, Hugh. Um, 
but his involvement and his mentorship, not only to students, but to so many people across this community and to so many people, both in the private and the public sector, has been outstanding. Um, I, I, I consider it a real privilege to consider um, Hugh a friend. Um, and of course, uh, giving up of his time as he usually does for things like this, um, before we talk to our other two panelists, uh, Hugh, I would just like to hand it over to you if you want to just perhaps summarize what you heard today or give us some of your, your, your quick thoughts of what the two Steves shared with us this evening. Over to you. Hugh, welcome. The main okay. theme that uh, I would have is that I would hope there would be a campaign to try to increase the 25% who don't have water softeners. Since my experience over 80 years is that I have never relied on a water softener and have never had any significant um, disbenefit from it and have gained probably about 30 or $40,000, I would suggest that is a strong incentive for people to choose the least uh, salt creating problem solution for themselves. A second comment I would make is that we are probably as a society soon going to get beyond the hang wringing stage of salt concerns. Uh, there is now increasingly clear evidence of the difficulties that we're in and once we get beyond the hand wringing stage to, as the introductory remarks at the beginning of the meeting pointed out, dealing with the problem rather than wringing our hands about it, we will uh, reach the stage of effective action when we start setting targets. And so the comment that was made about climate change requirements being strongly um, influenced by target setting as a key ingredient, I'm looking forward to the time when that applies to salt problems. So, one, one wonderful uh, that, that you would make that commit, uh, the connection with, uh, with climate change. And, and it just reminds me uh, from Jaden's presentation earlier today, um, is that some of you may be interested in doing a deeper dive on that. We're not going to talk about that tonight. However, tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock at Breezy Breakfast, I'll be there and we'll be doing a much deeper dive on that, uh, on the issue of, of uh, getting those targets around um, climate change. And uh, Rasha, if I could just trouble you in the chat, if you wouldn't mind putting the, uh, the Zoom link for that event tomorrow that Breezy Breakfast is holding. And on that, light, on that note, I'd like, to introduce, uh, I'd like to bring back both of the Steves. Um, uh, if you wouldn't mind joining us as well, and, and both of the Steves and Hugh, I um, keep you both with your with your microphones ready to go. The, the, the take home that I got from there was very interesting. What the two of you, uh, uh, Steves, were saying, and the questions we were getting, I found it very interesting that a lot of the questions were, well, what about this type of uh, softener? What about this type of softener? What about this type of softener? And yet the take home message I took from both of you, and definitely from Hugh, was that there are ways of us just reducing massive amounts of salt, whether it's just as simply as plumbing just the hot water line uh, as, as, as one option, or in Hugh's case, and in Steve Gamo's case, he said that um, you, um, um, uh, uh, you don't, you don't uh, soften at all. And I have to say that in our household, as much as I'd like to go without one, we actually have a built-in water softener in our dishwasher. So the only water that's being softened is a very tiny little box of salt that goes in about every two or three months. So I, 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 I found that an interesting dichotomy that while you guys were getting to solutions that inevitably people were searching for the technology that what do I need to buy to try to do this? And I'm, is this something that's difficult that you're finding to communicate this to the public either in Waterloo or in Guelph? Uh, I, it's not difficult to communicate. Uh, we haven't promoted the um, the, the built-in softeners uh, in the dishwashers. Those are uh, they're fairly rare on the market. Like uh, 
the market forces are working against us on some of that. Um, in Europe, it's very common. Um, it, the, it's the, uh, the Bosch dishwashers that have that. Um, but even though we don't have a water softener, uh, we have a dishwasher. And what we do is we just put a cup of uh, vinegar on the top rack of the uh, dishwasher and uh, that does a trick. In fact, vinegar is a miracle cure for hard water. For <laughs> uh, it's amazing. Um, and, um, you know, people talk about using more soap and, and uh, there's all different arguments back and forth. Um, um, certainly, uh, the, the water softener industry will tell you that, you know, you're going to really suffer if you don't soften all the water in the house. But um, I, I beg to differ on that one, um, and in, in our case, we don't soften any, but, uh, um, you know, I think we eventually will soften the hot water side, uh, probably, um, but then, of course, it becomes a little bit more corrosive, and the argument there, because uh, there was a study that said that you can, uh, hard water will reduce the effectiveness the efficiency of your hot water heater by 25% in, I forget it, what, I think it was three months. Um, and so they say, you know, put in a water softener. But what happens then is it becomes more corrosive to the softener or to the uh, water heater and the heater can actually spring a leak more quickly or you can uh, burn out your element because the element uh, corrodes more quickly. And there's a uh, an anode rod that goes into your water heater um, to prevent um, um, corrosion. Uh, it, it attracts the ions that would normally corrode your, your, um, your element. Um, so that rod actually corrodes away and you need to have that replaced more often. And most people don't realize that, that they need to do more maintenance on the water heater in order to make it last if you're running it with a water softener. So that's something that the plumbers will be able to help you out with if you start, uh, you know, if you want to make sure your, uh, your water heater lasts. Steve, yes, comments on uh, I tend to think it's, it's a few things. One, I, I always go back to this idea of, of this water softener. People aren't particularly familiar with, with the workings of water softeners. It, 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 like uh, Steve Gombo said, he didn't use the water softener until he moved into a house and then it was it was there for him when he moved there and all of a sudden he was a water softener user. Um, and, and I think that's the case is, is people moving in the house, they, it's not a technology they know much about, um, but they know what they need to do to keep it working. And like like any other appliance, when it breaks down, we just, we we tend to replace it. What's the next best thing? Hopefully years have gone by, so there is something more efficient and we consider it. But in this case, there's a lot of a lot of alternatives that we could be be looking at to reduce um, salt. Whether it is a new technology or whether we're ju we're just working with what we already have in our home, making small adjustments. Um, but at the same time, given that it's a, a technology we're not ultimately familiar with, it, it's not easy to sit down um, for everyone. Not everyone has the time to to sit down on a on a Tuesday, Thursday night, you name it, to to want to research the the wonderful exciting world of, of water softeners in their spare time and, and so we tend to replace what we have um, but there are an awful lot of solutions out there and, and I think as the the problems um, become more apparent with with where all that salt is going and, and knowing that it's not something we treat for in our system um, hopefully more people are gonna keep their eyes open to it and and think of some of those solutions. Gotcha. And Steve, I think you, Steve Yessie, I think you knew I was going to ask this question. I know Steve Gombos mentioned they do have that $50 rebate uh, uh, program. Uh, the city of Guelph has rebates for a number of water con conservation pieces. Um, and I know that Steve, the, uh, Steve Gombos, uh, the region of Waterloo has only just started, uh, you know, so I guess you know, you're still doing the evaluation on the impact of that. Is this, is this something that the city of Guelph would consider doing when you're reevaluating the rebate program so, and the water conservation uh, uh, and efficiency plan that you're working on? Well, yeah, it, it so happens that we are working on the, the water efficiency strategy that that will be coming out in 2021 uh, as an update to our, our past water efficiency strategy of 2016. So um, it is something that, that we're going to be looking at. And, and 
to the region's credit, they, they, they took a, a lead step in this and, and it's wonderful to be able to have uh, such a close partnership with them because we knew, we knew when they were going into this, this pilot and we're, we're, you bet we're watching very closely on, on what they find. Um, it, I'm, I'm really fascinated to, it, to see what, how many people sign up for the program and, and what are the results of it. Um, it is unfortunate that for, for all the obvious reasons, it's unfortunate that it's a, a COVID year, but um, for that program in particular, knowing it was going to hit in the summer um, and then having the, the year that we've had was um, disappointing, but we're watching with great anticipation to see what, what they're going to find out. Um, Cause yeah, it is, it is something we're looking at. And, and to, to that point, we are seeing, um, conditioners going into multi-residential buildings uh, locally. And it is something when, when the city helps uh, provide audits for, for some of those multi-residential properties, it is something that is suggested in those audits as well um, because the payback is, is there uh, and there's benefits all around. Um, I, I got some quick questions from people here. Um, what's, what's the price comparison generally between the conditioners and the softeners? Is there is there a range? Are they are they are they somewhat price competitive with each other? And and I'm assuming that this is about capital cost because once you consider the salt end of it, that's a that that changes the economics significantly. Uh, which one of you would like to take that question? Well, um, I can if you if you're sure. okay. Sure, go Steve. ahead, Steve. Yeah. Um, price difference. Well, it's. Basically, uh, marketing 101, whatever the market will bear. So right now, these NAC units seem to be selling for around the same price as a water softener. Sorry, can, can you clarify what an, NEC, uh, what an NEC model is? Nucleation assisted crystallization. So this is the, uh, uh, the, the alternative technology. Um, you know, you'll, it costs one to $2,000 to buy them on the market right now, which may be a little on the high side considering what's in it. There's only, uh, there's only about this much uh, active media in that, um, in that um, technology and you have to replace it. They're saying anywhere, well, the, the manufacturers are saying you have to replace the media every three years. So once you, you work out the operating, the, the purchasing and operating costs, there's not a huge difference. It still should be less expensive to run the one without the salt and water. Um, but, um, but again, um, the, the suppliers are, are, are in it for making money. So um, that was a frustration. Uh, for me in researching this, there's a wide range of price costs for water softeners too. And uh, through my research, I found out, you know, um, where to buy a, a good softener for, for the best price. And, and, then, and then again, uh, the media, the replacement media shouldn't cost as much as it does for this, this uh, alternative technology. But if more people were using it and, and it became more common, um, I think through supply and demand, the prices would come down and if there's competition. So um, not a lot of dealers offering those alternative units right now in, the, in this area. Uh, so you're, it, it, it's tough because there's so many water softener dealers who will you know, wanna sell the water softeners. Does that answer your question? Um, there, we have an awful lot of, yeah, I, I think so. We have an awful lot of questions really down in the weeds on specific types of conditioners relative to salt systems. And I'm, I'm just gonna ask you, I know that I've, I've, I've gone over the, the, the water soft, uh, sorry, the water conditioner study that you guys did. And I get the impression that the study deals with a lot of the down in the weeds questions that people may have based on the different types that are out there. Is that an appropriate place for us to send them? Because we will be adding that to the to the to the series of links that we'll be providing everyone that's at this event plus uh, through our website. Is that a good source for a starting point? Yes, there's a full report um, on the website, Great. Water Software Facts, that talks about that. And 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 again, yes, down in the weeds, those are the questions and uh, that people have. You know, is it going to affect how much soap I use? Um, 
what kind of soap should I use? Or do I need soap? Uh, things like that. Uh, so, you know, when you're, you're de it's a pretty um, involved topic, even just talking about um, water softeners. Um, and, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of arguments back and forth, uh, as well as um, information on the web. The, the difficult part, and the reason why Guelph and Waterloo Region teamed up to uh, do the testing and to pro provide that website is because there's such a, there, there's no other, or very little independent um, information for people to find on this stuff. They always end up getting, you know, if you Google it, you'll get um, really uh, uh, involved websites that are really uh, uh, created by the manufacturers and the dealers of water softeners. And um, it's a big, powerful industry. Um, and, um, you know, so there's, it's hard to find that sort of w the right answer. Uh, in some cases, maybe there isn't a right answer. But um, what I found is that using, for example, soap in the, in the laundry, I use the same amount of soap in my laundry now as I did before when I had a softener, simply because it's human nature. You got a cup, a measuring cup, and there's a line on it that tells you where to pour it. So you just pour it to the line and put it in. It doesn't matter whether the water's soft or hot, uh, cold to begin with. The laundry comes out clean. So um, now maybe I'm not an expert in laundry, but uh, I do do my own laundry every week. And, uh, it's not too bad. So you could talk about that all day, you know, the, yeah. the way different ways to clean things. Another thing, uh, I, I read something a long time ago that made sense was if you don't want the, the calcium carbonate buildup, the, the scale buildup on stuff, dry it off. So uh, I started, we started using a squeegee for the shower. Um, as soon as you squeegee it off, you don't have to worry about it. And, and it makes a huge difference. Uh, you don't have to then clean that off later as the water evaporates, it leaves that, the, the, the calcium carbonate on the surfaces. Um, but yeah, if you dry it off, then you're not gonna have that problem. Yeah, and I noticed a lot of people were talking uh, on the on the chat about vinegar as well. Uh, so you're saying just dry it. One thing, don't let the water sit. And and yep. secondly, when you're cleaning, using using vinegar, even slightly diluted vinegar, is, is a very good source. Uh, I, I I do want to take a bit to town on 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 the dishwasher thing. You know, we just we've got uh, we've had three different dishwashers over 30 years that, or for more than 30 years, that have built-in water softeners, and we were always able to find them. The interesting thing that we've had it found was that people just aren't aware that they exist. It winds up being an expensive dishwasher, but the dishwasher still winds up costing less than the combined cost of a dishwasher and a water softener. And, our, and the amount of salt that we use is significantly lower. And obviously, I don't break my back trying to put 50 pounds of salt into, into it as well. Um, another suggestion here is, can we just turn the water softeners off? Is there a switch? Can we just shut them off or can we bypass them? Sure, and okay. that's exactly what you do. You, you bypass your water softener and, and it's not going to go through the, the motions um, anymore. Uh, and so everyone's got a chance to try living their household's regular life uh, without the softener and, and using hard water and uh, putting vinegar in their dishwasher and, and, and maybe some vinegar in their, in their, within their laundry when they give it a wash and, and see how it feels to them and how it works with them. Do most of them have bypasses? I would think they do for maintenance purposes, don't they? Are they usually plumbed that way by and large? I don't know if yeah. I've ever come across a water softener that does not have a bypass. Okay. They should Good. all have okay. them, but Steve can correct me on that one. Yeah, yeah, I have not seen any without a bypass. Um, they they usually are plastic, um, and they're behind the softener usually, and it's just a, a it's like a plunger. You just push it through, and then that puts it on bypass. Because if you need that, if you want to repair the softener or or uh, or change it out. Hugh's kind of hiding on us here, but uh, but Hugh, we got a question for you specifically. In the
The question is, uh, you're still on mute there, Hugh. Actually, if you just yep. press your and hold your, there you go, there you go. In the 50 years. So, so have you had yep. issues? Yeah. I had to change the cartridges and faucets more frequently, and I had to learn how to um, debug the screen in the kitchen faucet. But other than that routine maintenance, the rest of the system ran well. I had a washing machine that was uh, about 48 years old when I sold the house. <laughs> so obviously not, not softening affected that and, it, and damn it, it made the thing last too long. Is that what you're telling us? Yep. <laughs> We've got a lot of other questions here. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, um, Khalid said he has a problem with laundry being dirtier after unloading from the washing cycle. Vinegar was, uh, has solved the problem partially. And Helen says that uh, we confirmed the pinhole impacts on our plumbing. So people are seeing a, a, lot, of the, a lot of the impacts that all of you guys are, uh, are, are, are suggesting there. Um, if there was one thing that people could do that you think that everybody that's got a water softener, they could do tomorrow, what would that be? The, the, the first thing on the list, what should they be doing? And I'll throw that out to all three of you. Why don't we start with Steve Yessi on that one? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, um, if, if nothing else, see if you can find that manual. And if you can't find it, Google it and um, take a look at that, that piece of equipment and, 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 familiarize yourself with it as much as you can because you might just be able to if nothing else you might be able to change some of the settings on there and, and you're going to end up perhaps recharging less or using less salt uh, within a recharge uh, and without spending a dime you've you've made uh, an improvement and and all the better that you know something more about about that piece of equipment in your house mm -hmm. um, there may be more significant changes doing something else but but that's something I think everyone can do um, provided they have the manual with them or, or like I said, if you give it a quick Google and most of them are online these days and, and you can find them pretty quickly. So read the manual, <laughs> what you're saying. <laughs> Understand what that black box is in your basement. Steve Gombos, I have a question. Steve Gombos, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, Try to figure out how much water, uh, like track your water and salt use. Um, it, tune into uh, when it's recharging. If it's recharging more than once a week for a family of three, you know that's inefficient right there. Uh, it shouldn't, you know, even once a week is kind of high. On the Water Softener Facts website, you can uh, uh, figure out how much uh, um, salt and water you could potentially be using when the recharges happen. There are some things you can do. Um, the capacity of your softener, is it big, is it too big? Can too you small? tell me how many facilities within the city of Guelph have to use water softeners? I, I, do you mean city owned or just facilities across the city? Uh, facilities owned by the city. O offhand, I couldn't, but uh, but it's something I could certainly figure out if if you want to send contact details in the um, in the in the messaging. Well, I have. Uh, probably, well, I was going to say water the region. We checked into it, and um, yeah, all our facilities only soften the hot water. And what they do, uh, facilities managers, they're really smart. They know that the ideal hardness for water is actually around six grains per gallon, five, six grains per gallon, maybe seven. And so what we do here is they have blending valves. And some of the European water softeners do that. You can set what hardness you want for it to come out with. Um, uh, and um, 
so our our water here is coming out at uh, out of the hot water tap. It's around uh, seven, six or seven grains per gallon of hardness, which is considered ideal. Uh, on the cold water, it's hard. It, it's coming out, um, you know, whatever, 22 grains or 25 grains per gallon. So um, yeah, that's that's an option to 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 consider as well. But you know, for a household. Um, you know, this, the simplest way is to do what I had suggested, which is just soften the hot water only. But all our facilities are, uh, would only soften um, the hot water side because you want to protect that, you know, plumbing and, and uh, boilers and all that kind of thing. Prevent against pinhole leaks, again, um, by keeping it at least somewhat hard. There's, there, there really is no reason to have zero hardness in your water like um you know that's just not uh that's not even necessary thank thanks steve we're getting a lot of questions on maintenance related to hot water uh, heaters and i don't think we've got the time to get into it there's there's a you know, quite a bit of discussion around it uh, if you don't mind, what we could do is we'll find a source and we'll put the, uh, some links uh, uh, at the website that we set up with all of this information um, from a maintenance perspective, because the maintenance on how to descale and how to maintain uh, uh, water tanks, uh, both electric and, uh, and gas, are different. And we're getting, we're, we're, getting, we're already past a, our expected um, shutdown time. So I'm going to leave, be, before I introduce um, Jaden for the very last word, Hugh, I'm going to leave the very last word for you on the technical side of things. Can I hand it over to you? And what, would, what do you want us to take away from tonight? First, I have to correct myself. I realized that it was the dryer that was 48 years old. Okay. Well. I replaced one <laughs> washing machine. So the washing machine was only 25 years old. Um, I think the message that I want to leave is the one that I made about setting targets. Mm -hmm. That what people should be taking away from this is that there needs to be a more attention paid to salt on a practical level by saying, what can we tolerate and how are we going to get down to that tolerable level? It's exactly what's being done in greenhouse gas emissions. We need to use the same approach to salt. That's an excellent thing. If we don't, if we don't establish those targets, we can't measure ourselves against them and we can't, uh, we can't see any progress on, on uh, moving forward at all. Uh, on that note, uh, I'm not going to thank you because I'm going to hand over the floor to my colleague, uh, Jaden. Jaden, are you out there in the, uh, uh, in, in, in Zoom land, can you join us? Yes, I'm here. Um, I just want to say a big thank you um, to both of you, Steves. Um, you've made my thank you quite short tonight having the same name. Um, and also to you, Hugh, it was really interesting learning about water softeners tonight. I know I grew up without one um, similar to you, um, Steve G. Um, I grew up on well water in rural Manitoba without a water softener. And my first experience with one has actually been this year in the house that I'm living in. Um, and just preparing for this event itself, Evan, Rasha and I have gone into so many discussions. Um, and both of you have actually answered so many of my questions and my, my curiosities that have been raised about the water softener. Um, and I know that I speak for everyone else here tonight in thanking um, all three of you for answering our questions and for giving us so much to think about and to consider moving forward uh, with our personal and with our home impacts on water um, and learning about how our decisions can influence the environment around us. Um, it was a great learning opportunity for me uh, as well as everyone else. And we just wanna say a huge thank you again on behalf of myself and Emerge um, for everyone who came out tonight um, and for the three of you for speaking so wonderfully about um, the topic of softener salts and our salty rivers. Um, so I hope you all take care and stay healthy uh, moving into the next few weeks um, and have a great evening. Thank you. Good night, everyone.